everybody and welcome to another session with us on Academy. I am Dr. Chloe Farahar. I am a white person with a shaved head, giant glasses and very summery red uh, sort of puffy sleeve dress. Oh, I love the puffy sleeves. They're great. Um, and today I am joined by my co-host Ben and we have our guests Fergus and Tanya and I'm going to um, read the words for Ben today and Ben says for their physical description that they are a young white male with dark blonde hair wearing a grey top with windows on the left and a bookcase on the right which got amazing things like um, Iron Man's helmet <laughs> um, and I'm going to ask Fergus first if that's okay to just say hello and a physical description. Hi uh, I'm Fergus I'm white I have long hair and I'm wearing a vest behind me is the corner of a messy desk fantastic um and Tanya <clears throat> hi my name is Tanya I am white I've got kind of blonde hair I'm wearing glasses and I'm sat in a white room with a tv behind me <laughs> yeah yours is a very clean room your your, your room actually makes oh, my no. brain quite happy not if I tilt the camera down a bit. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> makes my brain very happy to look at it as it as it stands. Um, and so I'm so pleased that we're doing this. I have spent a long time waiting to do this because I wanted Fergus and I couldn't. I didn't think we could do it without Fergus being here. So we are going to be talking about picking apart this thing called monotropism. Monotropism. We're going to maybe discuss how. Well, you said it doesn't matter or that there's no consensus about how to pronounce it. <laughs> but I do feel like I butcher it every time. Um, so this thing called monotropism, monotropism, um, what is it? And why is it important? Why is it a really important theory? Um, I haven't got it as a question, but I might bring up how does it relate to double empathy as an example? Um, so there's a little bit of echoing. Hopefully that's going to disappear. So if that happens for anyone else, anyone else here in the echo? hoping it's disappearing. Okay. Um, as usual, we like to start with our guests by asking who they are and what is or are their dedicated interests. Um, Fergus, if you wouldn't mind. So who are you? I know you're Fergus. Um, and what is or are your dedicated interests? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Fergus Murray. Um, I'm a science teacher based in Edinburgh um, and a writer and community organiser. I'm the, the current chair and one of the co-founders of, of Amaze Autistic Mutual Aid Society Edinburgh. Um, focused interests include science, particularly physics, um, monotropism, um, and I, lately I take quite a lot of slow motion video of water. There's just so much going on if you slow it down. Yes, actually, your your um, imagery and um, film are really quite stimmy and mm. calming and a bit ASMR-y as well, which I think is quite nice. Um, and then same question to Tanya. We have had Tanya on before, but it's always nice to remind us who they are yeah. and what their dedicated interests are. Yeah, so my name is Ken. I'm an autistic adult and a parent of autistic children. And I also work with autistic people all kind of ages as an educator, advocate, and, and kind of really, I suppose my job is to explain autistic experience to people, all the professionals that don't understand it. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. Uh, dedicated interest wise, anything to do, well, it's basically anything that smushes autistic experience and injustice. So it has been SEND law, social care law, um, theory, um, what's happening kind of in the world, uh, specifically for the minute, it's FII and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, anything in that kind of remit. And FII is fabricated and induced illness. Yep. For those who aren't too sure. Um, before I ask my next question, I just want to flag. So we've got lovely one of our um, sort of longish term educator learners in the comments section, Estin. Um, hello everyone, we have the broadcast on while doing other things during our vacation, evening tea, who is a young person watching parts of this with me wants me to write hello. Um, that's lovely. So hopefully um, your young person's also gonna learn about monotropism today. Um, and Amy also is really interested in the interest of, they're interested in the water videos that you do. Um, they're very interested in flow. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. That was really some nice comments. Um, so, 
Fergus, particularly since we haven't had you on before, um, when did you discover that you were autistic? Oh, um, so I was formally assessed at the age of 31, I think. So getting on for 13 years ago now, um, I knew that I had autistic traits for a long time before that, but I didn't think I was monotropic enough to qualify for a diagnosis um, until things went really wrong in a relationship. And it became clear that my being autistic helped, helped explain a lot of the miscommunications and so on. Interesting. Okay. I might pick that apart as well, like how and how and why. Um, make a note of that. Um, Tanya, yourself, when did you discover you were autistic? Um, I've got a pretty similar story to uh, most parents, actually. Uh, my youngest really struggled when he started school and like any undiagnosed autistic person would do um, when they when they figured out there's absolutely no help, even though we had all these wonderful policies and, and things. Um, kind of deep dived in, in the research and uh, had a lot of light bulb moments and head scratching and figured it out from there. And I was formally formally identified when I was about 30. So yeah, so I've probably known for about eight years now. And sorry, as everyone's used to, I will make notes as I'm going along because I'm like, oh, I'm gonna come back to that um, and things like that. So just so you know, that's what I'm doing. Okay, let's jump in then. So what is this thing called monotropism, monotropism? How, how would you like to pronounce it, Fergus? I pronounce it monotropism, um, which my mum always pronounced it that way, but she didn't really have any particularly strong feelings about it. Um, I think when says monotropism and so does Damien Milton. So, um, and I've been impressed by the range of other ways that people have found to pronounce it in recent months. So, um, yeah. So what is it though? Um, it's a cognitive style. It's a tendency to focus your cognitive resources on a small number of things um, to enter into attention tunnels is one, one way to put it. So monotropic thinkers tend to sort of put all of their processing eggs in one basket, if that makes sense. Um, so we're likely to miss things that happen outside of our attention tunnel. Um, and when it comes to integrating multiple streams of information um, coming in and going out, that's often very difficult. Um, so that, that particularly shows up in um, social interactions in fairly obvious ways, because neurotypical social interactions assume that everyone is keeping track of not just the words, but the tone of voice and the facial expressions and the body language and the social relations and uh, you know, subtext and all of this. And if you have a, a mind which can't really process that many different things at once, that's very challenging. Um, and of course it lends itself to, to focused interests. Mm. Um, sometimes people talk about monotropism all, it, pretty much entirely in terms of interest and that, that's a valid way of thinking about it. Um, but I think it sometimes leads people wrong because it's not just about special interests, it's about anything that captures your attention. So fewer things capture autistic attention at any given time than for most people. Okay, so that's interesting because, and then I'm, I've made my note, which is how would that then, for instance, explain sensory processing and overwhelm? So I'm gonna use your example. So it's the example, I'm having a conversation with somebody and I'm getting overwhelmed because there's so much else going on and I'm trying desperately just to focus on what that particular person is saying and being autistic, I'm not really picking up on the social cues or the things that aren't said. Hmm. How would monotropism explain that overwhelm maybe? Yeah, yeah, so so first off, um it's it's too much to deal with that many sensory streams at once um quite often we can get used to dealing with at least two in a particular context that we are relatively well used to for example um but 
yeah, if we're trying to process one thing and there's a bunch of other things that are like going on in the background, competing for our attention, um, then that just gets very difficult. Um, I think it's useful here to think about filters as something which takes processing resources. So filtering out background noise is an active process, right? It takes mental energy. If you're very tired, it's harder to process, it's harder to filter things out. Um, and in general, if you're autistic, it's harder to, to filter things out. Um, and the more things you're having to filter out, the, the more cognitive load is taken up by that and the less you have left over for anything else. Um, so that's a big part of the, the sensory overwhelm that autistic people are prone to, I think. Um, I, I think, I'm getting a bit more speculative here, but I think that there's something going on where, you know, the more you use a sense, the more, like the stronger it gets, the, the more finely honed it, it gets. So I think about, um, you know, I'm very keen on food. Like I, I love to cook um, and I pay a great deal of attention to, to smells and tastes. And I think that, 44 years of doing that has given me a relatively sensitive palate and nose. But um, if someone gets on the bus and they're wearing perfume, I sometimes have to get off. So, and I think that that's to do with the intensity with which autistic brains process things and experience things. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're, we're firing a lot of processing resources at a sense. Yeah. And that builds up over time i tend to kind of because i'm a visual thinker it's it's always visual to me so i imagine that every human has processing space and if your brain is a monotropic brain you zoom in on that and you put a lot of resources into that but we only have so, so it gets a little bit like homer simpson when he learns something new it pushes something old out not even this is literally what I see in my brain it's a wonderful place um so uh, specifically around interception and things like that so I think for me what explains it and what happens is if you're splitting your attention in a polytropic way because we live in a neurotypical world um which you're just not supposed to do and you also have unconscious attention tunnels and those unconscious attention tunnels are tied into unconsciously managing and keeping tabs on your sensory input and sensory processing so we can either lose that because we've home homer simpson it because we're diverting our attention one way or sorry homer i need to stop talking about homer simpson now or we just don't have the space left in order to be able we, we've run out of spoons we're out of resources um, so that's how I would look at sensory processing and monotropism. I may be entirely wrong, but that's how it looks in my mind. That, that, that sounds about right to me. Um, I don't know if you've, you've come across Chris, Chris Memmott's roundabout hypothesis of autism. Oh, no. Sort of another way of looking at the same thing. It's like your roundabout gets filled up. Most, most people have like smooth traffic in and out of their, their mental roundabouts at any given time. And it, with autistic yeah. people too much comes in and from too many directions it just all gets clogged yeah up. and i think kieran talks about the uh, monotropic highways quite a lot in his training right. so even with the kids stuff he does it with cars and when you're keeping out you know you've got like eight senses and they're all cars and you have to unconsciously keep them all at the same pace and if something else comes in you're running out of space in which to manage that so yeah that's how i would look at it so I'm really interested because, oh, I'm just echoing a bit, hold on. Um, I'm really interested in, so what you said right at the start, actually, Fergus, which is that you felt that it could help you explain communication and potentially relationship difficulties. I know that was more around you discovering you're autistic, but you also mentioned that monotropism helped to some extent, if I didn't miss here. Could you explain that bit then, how it explains communication, for instance, the communication differences of autistic people um, and potentially then might be a second question, how that relates to double empathy? Because we um, know about double empathy problem for people who don't. It's this idea that autistic people don't lack perspective taking or empathy. Um, it's just that we do it differently. And so when you have a communication breakdown, 
with a non-autistic person, it's because their perspective taking is quite poor with autistic people. So the communication breakdown is between neurotypes, not necessarily between autistic and autistic, non-autistic and non-autistic. So that's a roundabout way of saying, how would mon monotropism explain the communication differences? Yeah, so if you can't juggle that many channels at once, and everyone expects you to, that's going to lead to misunderstandings. You know, um, one of the things that happens to autistic people a lot is people assume that we're being deliberately obtuse when something just didn't make sense. Like there was a bit of subtext that we were missing or a bit of context that we just didn't have in mind at the time. Um, or they were trying to convey something with their tone of voice and we've just listened to the words and we missed it. Um, and, you know, going the other way, non-autistic people expect us to be communicating with our tone of voice and our body language and all of this all the time. Um, so if, you know, some autistic people have very flat affects, right? They just talk sort of like this and they communicate only using words. And some people think that they are angry or, or slow or, or something like that. Right. Um, so just having different processing styles immediately leads to misunderstandings. Um, and. Yeah, you know, going back to the double empathy problem, people who process the world very differently just have a difficult time understanding each other's mental lives. That's just a natural consequence of having very different processing styles. I think those are the main things. And Victoria here says, is it that we are focused on the words and the meaning of them? Can be, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say not not always, but yes, a lot of the time, because words are sort of, they feel like the central part of communication, right? You'll sometimes hear statistics like 93% of communication is nonverbal. I'm pretty sure that's like, not actually quantifiable, but certainly a, a lot of communication is nonverbal at any given time. But the verbal bits are the bits that make the most obvious sense. They're the bits that we're, you know, trained as kids to pay attention to. And everyone just assumes that we're going to get the hang of body language and tone of voice and um, facial expressions and managing all of those at once. So I'm thinking I should potentially have asked Rachel and I didn't think to, um, but Rachel Cullen, because I'm thinking they probably more than likely actually um, have brought monotropic theory into their work, which so Rachel is about to start their PhD with Damien. Um, and if you haven't looked at their stuff, but even if you have Fergus, I like to explain for people who may be in watching this happen. So Rachel Cullen, very exciting hypothesis um, built around basically the pragmatic language abilities of autistic people um, and why I think it's really exciting. And there seems to be this crossover. So I'm, I imagine monotropic theory has come into their work is what they say is they looked at, because they have two linguistics degrees, that autistic people, we seem to process at the word level when we hear people talk to us. Whereas arguably non-autistic people process at the sentence level and they pass sentences as whole chunks quite quickly and that's apparently a known thing in linguistics which I'm not that's not my background um we process it looks like at the center at the word level sorry and the context is for us purely in the words whereas with non-autistic people the context is not just the words it's who is saying it what's their face doing what are they wearing are they wearing a suit then I probably should be a bit more professional in how I reply and so on um so I think there definitely is some link there with the monotropic theory. Um, mm. Tanya, did you ever have any, because you you probably have heard Rachel talk about their theory before, and you understand monotropic theory better than I do. <laughs> this is why I also yeah. like to do. So yeah, um, I also think that autistic people probably focus on words more than context, because I believe that, you know, when we talk about, um, non-verbal communication, if you like, um, things like tone, body language, et cetera, et cetera. We're never expressly trained in that. And, you know, going back to double empathy, 
if somebody is having a different experience, then all of those, I mean, for example, we do have non, you know, non-word autistic communication. We have stimming, we have all, yeah, all sorts of things. Um, so I'm not actually surprised that autistic people focus solely on the words because that's the only reliable thing for us. Um, and it we're makes in another autistic minority. person, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and also I like the way that that expands, like Rachel's expand into emotion as well. So if you like, the entire language and the entire words has been built very much on a neurotypical experience of the world and the way that they describe things. And when you go into like emotion and and naming emotions and the difficulties that we have nobody's actually said is that because you know the these emotion words people use are not enough detail for us because we are monotropically experiencing emotion and whoever just experiences one at once um and is that word right so this is why you know with in autistic culture or at least in in my kind of circle, we, we create our own words for emotion and stuff like that. So it's all very much tied into this big, lovely smush of, of theory that all just makes sense. And I think I said it to you guys before, like for me, I work with an awful lot of very traumatised autistic people from across all ages and stuff, especially in like psychiatric care and, and social care and stuff. Um, and monotropism is is the foundation. It's like laying the cornerstone of helping them understand their autistic experience, because from there, the way you can go with communication, with mental health, with the mask that they've been had imposed upon them by neurotypical services and all that stuff. But yeah, anyway, I'm going to stop ranting because I'm quite passionate about it because it literally is just the centre. Um, my partner, Sonny Hallett, who is a counsellor, has, has done a lot of work on naming of emotions for autistic people. And yeah, like, I think one, one way to think about this is, again, polytropic people, people who are not monotropic, tend to sort of have a, just a bunch of processes going on all the time, right? So if someone says, oh, are you sad? Then they like, look at their overall way of being and they're like oh yeah so that's what sadness is um so there's just a, a different process of learning emotions when you're polytropic yeah. compared with when you're monotropic yeah. and who says that we've got the same emotions i mean we all identify the color green but it looks different to every single person it's bonkers to actually it's it's kind of you know it's kind of the people that don't believe that there is life out there in the universe it's a little bit smug <laughs> to think that way um yeah. so yeah yeah and like emotions just are a lot more complex than people think you know they think that everyone knows what they mean when they name an emotion and actually it can mean like demonstrably yeah. different things to different people yeah to me meh is definitely a better description of, of my emotional experience than sad or deflated or happy or any of these things i explained so, this to yeah. a consultee today which was exactly this that we feel potentially not necessarily lied to but misled about neurotypical people like I say are maybe able to grab the so-called key feeling that they think they're having at that point in time and we're like what do you mean you're having one <laughs> right we're, we're like i'm hangry there's a stone in my shoe that i can feel and i'm sad and i'm this and i'm you know all these things um and i would explain like you say we we come up with our own ways of explaining our emotions so if somebody were to ask me how are you feeling and then all of a sudden they've asked me this really big question. To me, that is a huge question. How am I supposed to pull all those things apart? And it makes me feel small. It makes me feel like that is such a big question. So I will reply, I feel small. And I'm told, well, that's not feeling. Well, it definitely is for me. I feel tiny now. You've made me feel like so overwhelmed with all the things that I might feel. Yeah. And uh, then to layer on top of that, you've got to translate that into neurotypical as well because even if you are speaking to another autistic person you've grown up in this world where there's so many layers of like trauma and validation masking etc 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 that no wonder communication for us is is hard because are we masking neurotypical are we not are we it, it's so complex so i tend to just try and throw 
put monotropism in and throw the kind of neurotypical expectations of trying to train a person how they feel or tell them how they feel and all of that stuff and kind of create your own language around it, which really was really helpful. But yeah, monotropism, it's just, it, it explains everything comes from monotropism in a thought tree. <laughs> So I'm going to bring up Ben's um, comment here as well. So Ben says, I'm curious as to whether my frustration and overwhelm be when being interrupted on an activity I am hyper-focused on is due to me having a monotropic mind and struggling with the interruption in my attention. And Fergus is nodding and Tanya is nodding. <laughs> yes, it's an absolutely classic example of, of monotropism and... Actually, and it's something that none of the other accounts of autism seem to have anything to say about. Um, it's like, what, it's a central feature of autistic experience, I would say, that being pulled out of something that you're paying attention to is intensely uncomfortable. Um, and like, literally, th there's no way to account for that in any of the, the so-called big three autism theories or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, I sometimes talk about it's it's like you're pushing a, a loaded shopping cart, right? And then you have to suddenly change direction. Um, and, you know, if you're if you're not careful, then things are going to fly off the top. Um, so it's like if I'm expecting something to happen and I have to change course abruptly, then I'm liable to keep on expecting it to happen, even though really I know that it's not going to. I don't know if the rest of you get that, but I think that's that's one of the things about, about Dee Bailey. Um, and for me, actually, this is one of the most useful things because although I'm talking about it as a classic monotropic experience, it is something that almost everybody is familiar with, right? If you pull someone away when they would almost finished a chapter of their book, right? Or um, there's five minutes to go before the end of the game, or they've almost completed their level. They're like, oh, why would you do that? Um, and that just happens to autistic people all the time, especially kids at school. You know, they're, like, they're just not allowed to enter attention tunnels and, and stay in them. Um, or to have better transition times. Like, really, we need much lengthier transition times. Um, so, this, I'm um, sadly, this won't mean much to people who don't think in pictures. So if you're an Afghan, I really apologize. Maybe you could try drawing it or asking someone to. Um, but I've been trying to describe that difficulty, um, breaking away and transitioning to something else. Um, we'll come back to this in a second because it's basically what we're talking about, which so Victoria here says, how much does autistic inertia play into monotropism or re reverse? How does monotros monotropism, never going to get it right. Um, explain autistic inertia and I was talking about this and, and my description to try and explain it to families professionals and so on is you're on a train and you or you are the train and you're really really into the thing you're doing and you're at speed doing the thing and then you're expected quite quickly to change tracks but that doesn't happen we can't just change tracks what has to happen is a little dude gets off your train and you have to slow down. Dude gets off the train and they go over and they pick up and switch the track. And then you have to pick up speed again. And all of that is really going to take a lot of time. It's not as quick as, oh, a new track. Isn't that, mm. no, that's not happening. I also think with the attention and the attention tunnels as well, it, it sometimes helps me to remember that while we're saying that autistic people like to zoom in on things I mean we all know that you know autistic people think in detail they look at the detail rather than the bigger picture I think that's rubbish I just think there's no point of seeing a big picture unless you've got the detail right um but you know that that that's kind of like a, a multi-sensory experience for us so we got the processing space and we may be dividing that over I don't know three attention tunnels but we're, when we're pouring that into into that is kind of a multi-sensory thing and then we have to get all our little ducks in a row with the speed that we're going out so we're like right okay we can stop paying attention so much to that and it just kind of hits the sweet spot and that's what flow is it's when you're happy with the way that everything's going and you're you're deep into it and and you've gotten to the point where you can almost consciously or unconsciously go right okay i'm in the flow now it's okay for me to let go of the speed that I'm doing this. It's okay for me to not worry about what's coming next. It's okay for me. It feels very much a place of safety. 
because you know as a monotropic thinker and i think a lot of autistic anxiety is based in this as well it's the surprise because we know that if there is a surprise or something we're not expecting the amount of detail that we have to put into focusing on a new thing or shifting on a new thing we only have that finite amount of processing space so i think very much for autistic people a lot we're unconsciously managing those attention spoons or spoons generally even before we know what spoons are um and trying to avoid that meltdown or trying to avoid situations that could potentially push past what our kind of monotropic brain can deal with and i think that that happens with neurotypical people as well because you look at the mental health crisis that that's you know that's happening in people and ultimately whether you're polytropic or monotropic there is only so much people can juggle so that's that's where i think that kind of comes in as well and then we start looking at going into mental health and like what happens to an autistic person when they are constantly forced to be in a poly i mean we do it to children at age four and five it's like going through the seven circles of hell until you're 18 if you're particularly monotropic um so for me it, yeah it's that's what it is <laughs> so we have to remember it's the detail and the multi-sensory experience and the consciously going I can relax I'm okay with that part of it I'm okay with this part of it I'm okay with my surroundings I know that nobody's going to knock on the door and know that nobody's going to do this and that's flow for me yeah and, and I think it's it's flow flow is not something that we talk about enough still um people in general mm -hmm. um you know it, it's something that has been a major part of positive psychology for a long time right the entering flow states is one of the things which people generally need to be satisfied with life and so a flow state is you know it's like when you're in the zone you're it usually involves applying a skill of some sort um at a level which is challenging but not too challenging um and this is probably familiar to everyone listening right if you get in the flow state um the rest of the world kind of drops away you're likely to lose track of time um and notice that those are two classic autistic slash ADHD characteristics there, right? Um, so I think one way to think about autism is that we are very prone to entering flow states um, and very reliant on entering flow states. Um, I think because the world is so stressful and confusing so much of the time. Um, but yeah, when you, when you enter a flow state, you feel safe. Um, and usually you can't enter a flow state unless you're feeling kind of safe, um, unless it's actually like a threat response, I guess. But. Today it was, again, because it, it was a consultee and actually um, because it was somebody I know, um, they came to my house, which is not that usual. Um, I don't tend to have people around, um, but it was really nice. And I did exactly that. I got into a, f a flow state because I was in my own home. I was with people I knew. And I was talking about my dedicated interest and I just went off and it was like they came around at one and they left at five. And I don't think I stopped talking the whole time because I was just in that thing of this is this is this is where I'm comfortable. This is where I'm happy. This is what gives me meaning. We talked a lot, actually, about the difference between living up to your potential, which gets thrown at people quite often. That's not what they mean. They mean living up to my expectations. That's not the same as your own personal potential versus finding meaning. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean spiritually. It, that might be that case for some people. But I mean, just the thing that makes you happy, like say flow state, you get into it and you're safe and you're happy and it's where you're comfortable. But there's some, like I said, some challenge, but not challenging. So like it was a little bit of a challenge today because it was some I was discussing things with somebody. They'd never heard of most of the things I talked about. So I'm trying to explain things in a way that they will understand. And that's great. And that's fun um, mm. and enjoyable mm. for me. I think as well, we can, I mean, I often see this and, and anybody who's um, looked at a young person who's entered burnout is we often seek out flow state as well. I think it can quite often help with unconsciously processing other things um, and things that kind of mount up. For me, wallpaper TV is an absolute must. It's the only thing that switches my brain off to kind of get rid of the fuzz. 
um, from things that have happened over the day, if you like. Um, but yeah, flow state can be very much, it, you know, if, if you're if you're needing more and more flow state to just exist constantly. So not only is flow state almost like a stimmy joy, but it's also like stimming. I would say it's a form of stimming is something that we do to regulate as well. And if we're doing that more and more, so it can be quite a good indicator of where where you are as well. If you're not used to managing your own internal feelings or, or understanding them. And I just want to flag, unless anyone wanted to speak to that, um, I just wanted to flag Amy's um, little girl's point. So Amy and their family are a neurodivergent family. Um, and Amy says, my little girl said today, if I was a teacher, I would let the kids finish what they are doing. And what I think is amazing and frustrates so many of us and distresses so many families is actually sometimes, if not a lot of the time, young people are actually quite good at knowing what they need and what works for them. And the frustration comes, I had a fantastic young person, I'm not going to go into detail because it's not my story to tell, but they'd expressed, actually, I can't do that thing. And this is why. And they were quite, you know, doesn't articulate is, is not the word I necessarily want, but they'd explained. And it was very reasonable. Um, and it was completely dismissed. And it's like, but this young person knows, and it wasn't an unreasonable request. Um, and so this, you know, this young person, Amy, can you remind us how young your little girl is? You know, this fact, if I was a teacher, I would let the kids finish what they are doing. Like knowing that it's it's frustrating, it's distressing to be pulled out of something that you're immersed in. Um, and there was another comment that I wanted to flag that kind of went along with that. Where is it? This one. So this is Nick um, says, when we started home education, I was surprised my elders wanted to do half days or more of subjects as school had always said they had limited attention, which was wrong. So what it was, they weren't allowed to get into good flow states. And, and I think that I think about those awful transitions between you're doing this for the first 50 minutes, then you're doing this, which is a completely different topic for the next 50 minutes. That's awful. That's really awful that you can't get into it. Yeah, yeah. For me, as a school teacher, it, it frustrates me deeply that nothing about the school system allows the kind of autonomy that I think kids need, really, and and thrive on, um, and particularly mm -hmm. monotropic kids. You know, um, I've been reading a lot about self direct self directed education recently, and how. You know, it, it's stuff that I, I kind of knew already, but crystallizing a lot of things about kids who for whom school just doesn't work, right? Like I, I work with a lot of kids for whom schools haven't worked. Um, I work at, at two different schools, which both take quite a lot of kids who are who move move to those schools because they had awful school experiences somewhere else, basically. Um, and yes, yeah, so much of that is that frustration of, of you know not being able to enter flow states for much of the time at all or when you when you do enter a flow state being ripped out of it at, a, at some arbitrary time um and the lack of autonomy i think is is huge as well i think autistic people even more than other people i mean everyone needs autonomy right but like I think for us, it often feels like the world is very out of control um, and unpredictable. So being able to assert control over some sphere brings us a feeling of stability. I, th I personally think that that's a big part of why we stim. Like that's, it's controllable sens sensory input. Yeah, just to expand on what you were saying earlier, because you can remember if you use a skill, you hone it and you think that that kind of happens monotropically with other senses, like you can lose it. I think the reason that autistic people need so much more autonomy, if you like, it, uh, because what we see a lot of is interception and alexithymia problems. And then, you know, you go in with the, you know, insecure sense of self and the masking and the rhetoric that we're fed about depression and neurotypical mental health. You know, if if an autistic person never feels like they're peopling right and they're experiencing all that invalidation, but then they have no autonomy, is it no wonder that 
over half of us don't know how we feel or what we need or or who we are. <laughs> so yeah, autonomy is so important for that reason. And it's tied into monotropism because if you are never put in a position where you are thinking about how you feel and what you need and following your own internal senses, then you're going to lose it, aren't you? So I almost think, you know, is society and its impact on children specifically, but also adults, kind of creating this alexithymia rather than them just going, oh, here's alexithymia, here's a thing, because we see it very much with trauma as well. I was going to say the gaslighting, and mm. then you can't trust your own bodily feelings and things. It can be a reason, yes, for potentially for alexithymia. Mm. I just want to flag some of the words. So um, Tanya mentioned interoception, which is... Um, what we whether we feel what we feel on the inside so do you know when you need to go to the bathroom for instance or do you know that you're having a physical sensation that some people might relate to um, butterflies in their stomach which is this phrase that supposedly relates to anxiety or excitement which is even more confusing which is it is it excitement or is it anxiety how am I supposed <laughs> to know the difference when it's based on the physical sensation what was the other word I think uh, lixothymias um you mentioned was it just the two so then elixithymia is that difficulty or um sometimes inability to recognize in your body that you're having a, an emotion or a feeling um and the difficulty putting it to words and um articulating that which to be very clear is not the same as not having feelings it's just that we might be disconnected from our bodies or the idea of these things called feelings they're very strange um these things called feelings um I just want to flag Ben's um, comment as well. So Ben here is saying, would you say monotro monotropism relates to a need or want for control? And I flagged it quite quickly as well because you'd already mentioned control. Um, so to avoid the fears of the unknown when it comes to juggling multiple things. Fergus is nodding. <laughs> You're just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go, Ben. Ben was like, I might not know enough about this topic. It was like, no, Ben. I fine. think it. <laughs> Sorry, I think it also massively feeds into demand avoidance as well. Massively feeds into demand avoidance. Um, you know, and I'm not going to get into the politics of whether demand avoidance is or isn't a thing because it is. But um, yeah, you know, um, or what people choose to call it or what they think creates it or whatever. But monotropism massively feeds into that because, um, you know, if you if you are constantly forced to live in a place with all the invalidation and, and trauma and masking that, that goes on, which is taking a massive part of your processing space up already, and then you're in kind of a polytropic world where your attention has to be split left, right and centre, you are constantly guarding what you've got left. So any demand that's placed on that is almost an attention shift. You've literally got not got the change spare to do that. Um, but then, I mean just kind of hypothetically if you wanted to put that into a pda context the biggest producers of demand or emotional upset are people so of course you would avoid the people but you would also study those people <laughs> to avoid that threat so there's a lot to be looked at and unpicked specifically around demand avoidance and pda and looking at that through a non-pathologizing monotropic lens because a lot of it does make sense yeah, there, there's a connection that I, I'm not sure that I've seen anyone make explicitly between demand avoidance and so-called regression in autistic kids. So you know that it's fairly common for autistic kids to pick up some language and then just stop using language again. Mm -hmm. Back off from that. They're like, oh, no, don't want that. Um, and... I, so my mum wrote about this, talks about this a bit, um, and I've realised that I haven't named my mum, Dinah Murray, who was one of the people who came up with monotropism um, around about the early 90s. Um, so she's been, she was writing about it for almost 30 years. Um, it's not a very new idea. It's just taken a while to penetrate. Um, yeah, so, so she would talk about how um, her theory for what was happening there was that um, when kids are first exposed to language it's used to share attention like to, to like be oh there's a cat cool cat that's nice um, but then at some point it's like hey cat but I was paying attention to this 
Um, so language is a tool for manipulating other people's interest systems, is the way that she, she put it. Um, not, not in a pejorative sense, like necessarily, it, just manipulating in the sense of doing things with, right? So if you have language, you use language, then other people can use language to redirect your attention. And if your experience of redirecting attention is that you're constantly pulled out of this delightful flow state and forced to like wrench your attention somewhere else, um, then that could be quite off-putting. Like that's, I can see how that could put someone off the whole idea of using language. I think, you know, research could, could further research is required to explore that. And well, I don't think it's ever really been done. That was what I wanted to talk about at some point, didn't I? And I need to make that note so we do come back to it, which is the, why isn't there more research being done? And we're going to come back to that. I'm going to, I'm going to make my note. So hold on. Did I yeah, and re it's, it's regression and burnout, isn't it? It's regression and burnout, I think, is one. it's one and the same thing. Um, I think even an adult experiencing a pretty bad burnout, you, you do lose skills. I, and sometimes they don't come back. Like we know that. I know that from personal experience. But monotropically, I think, and this is what always makes me wonder, like, okay, so so we've got, we know monotropism is a thing. I think there's there's enough anecdotal evidence of an entire army of community speaking and going, this is us, to say that that's reliably a thing. I don't think, you know, we need anybody else to write it down anymore. But, you know, they will. Um but yeah, it makes me wonder that when you are forced, so take away the neurotypical kind of invalidation masking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you are forced to live in that polytropic way with no autonomy, obviously burnout is the result of that, you know, but what else is there? What else does that explain? What comes off of that? Like what are the logical, and then, you know, because I'm really disappointed David isn't here actually, because he would have run with this, because then you're into, you know, because then you're into kind of like things like depression, which isn't really depression, it's burnout or voice hearing and so on and so forth. But, yeah, I always wonder what happens when it's too much. Um, is that when what you're saying is when there is that too much? Yeah. We're more like to yeah, see we, acquired we and we talk. Yeah. Yeah. So we. We go into burnout and we see what we call regression and so on and so forth. But we also see that, we, you know, we have really grim outcomes for us. And we're looking societally at this, but we're having to live in a way that our brains aren't designed to live. And we know that for a neurotypical person, they get work related stress and anxiety, for example, or they experience a specific trauma and they have required neurodivergence. So if we're living in this real place that we're not designed to be living in, what is you know, why is nobody going, hello, this is a monotropic brain. This is what you are doing to it. And this is why you're having these poor outcomes. Like, why is nobody making that link? Because it's like, I don't know. It's a power thing, right? Like, I mean, is it just to me that it's obvious? It's so bloody obvious, isn't it? That that's why we get so many more co-occurrences. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems fairly obvious to me. Um but then, you know, I'm I'm autistic. <laughs> and I think part of the problem is that you can't just like describe autistic experiences to a non-autistic person and then they're like, oh yeah, that's obvious. Of course that's right. <laughs> um, and of course, the autism establishment has been dominated by non-autistic people historically, very heavily. Um, and that's starting to be less true, which is obviously related to the fact that research is starting to happen on monotropism. I mean, you know, it's been like mentioned from time to time in research papers, um, at least going back to Dinah, Dinah's paper with Wen Lawson and Mike Lesser in 2005, um, attention monotropism and the diagnostic criteria for autism. Now that's been cited, I don't know, four to 500 times, something like that. Um, probably about half of those are in the last five years you know it's a 17 year old paper um so let's do that question now then no yeah. i'm going to jump to my questions so monotropism and research and the lack thereof so i mentioned before we came on to the live that you've got damien milton 
coming up with a double empathy problem took some time and then we finally got some non-autistic researchers who were interested in it and they did some research to demonstrate that the double empathy problem is happening that we have that communication breakdown um, between cross neurotype uh, dyads or pairs conversations and tasks and then like I say I'm very excited because now we've got Rachel Cullen who's potentially showing the why like what is actually happening underneath in you know what is the actual mechanism potentially and it's about this pragmatic language difference and that took ages why did that take so long um where are we then with monotropism so what research is there um and what does it say so there's there's lots of research which has used the idea right it's been used to help explain lots of things um you know there's been a, a bit of research on autistic play there's been research on communication um Gemma Williams in her PhD um actually her, her PhD is sort of uses relevance theory which was what my mum's PhD was about as well so in a sense that's monotropism coming full circle um so Dinah my mum's PhD was on language and interests um and it it drew on relevance theory and that was God, she finished that when I was about eight, so sometime in the mid eighties, um, maybe maybe early eighties even. Um, yeah, so that that's one area that it's been used. And of course, Damien Milton has has talked about it a lot in the context of communication as well, um, and flow and interpersonal flow, which I felt like um, was a tangent that we could have gone on earlier when you were talking about uh, your your four hour conversation, but. Um, Let's leave it for now. It's only now that we have a master's student who is trying to actually like validate monotropism, like directly test its predictions in a formal empirical way. Um, and she's done that by one of your questionnaire, which was um, produced by a bunch of autistic people working together. Um, Richard Woods was sort of the main driving force behind the questionnaire. Um, but we have a, a monotropism mailing list, which various people contributed to, and we kind of um, went through the questions and tried to make them as, as coherent as possible. And she will be presenting her results so far, um, slightly unfortunately at the Autistica Research Festival. Um, I won't get into why why that's unfortunate, but um, a lot of autistic people have problems with autistica, and they are yeah. not unreasonable. Um, mm. But the autistica research festival is free, so you can attend it without giving them any money. And um, there are basically no non-problematic research conferences on autism, really, um, aside from like the, the interdisciplinary interdisciplinary autism research festival, which happens, what, two years ago now, I guess, was it? La no, it was last year, um, which was brilliant, uh, but that was autistic run. Um, and, you know, occasionally there are other autistic run research festival um, conferences and so on. Part participatory autism research conference does some. I've gone on a massive tangent there. No, no, Sorry that's fine. That. A, a couple <laughs> of times we've done um, some <laughs> anyway. Kent as well. Um, so we've done yeah. the Inside Out conference. Yeah, 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 good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll take there. it back. There are unproblematic autism. No, 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 we don't do them often. Along it, very was, often. it was off. It was I do have I'm a question, though. Oh, sorry, Chloe. Attention difference. I'm just double checking. Um, yeah, Gemma, Gemma Williams is autistic, right? Because I've yes. just double checked in my book. Um, so that means they're welcome to come on and talk about, as long as they're not neurotypical, they they're welcome to come on and tell us about what they found. I was just wondering, um, actually, kind of funnily, kind of made me chuckle a little bit, that if, um, you know, all the researchers that um, are using monotropism are autistic or heavily influenced by autistic people at the very least. So I'm wondering if monotropically, all these researchers are just kind of assuming that it's a given and it's a concrete thing that, that because it's quite lengthy, and monotropically, we've just kind of Homer Simpsoned it as everybody knows that. 
a bit like when we first read Double Empathy, it kind of seems obvious, doesn't it? It's the most obvious thing, but it wasn't a thing until it was written down. And burnout, for example, has existed within the community for so long, but the research was only, was it one, two years ago? So maybe that's what it is. Yeah, and I mean, it's worth saying that although the predictions of monotropism haven't been really directly predict directly tested, um, a lot of them are extremely well known. You know, there, there's been research on autistic difficulty integrating different sensory streams and switching between different sensory streams forever. Um, obviously, we are known to have intense interests, of which we pursue to the exclusion of other things. We, we know about the sensory processing differences. So, you know, to a large extent, monotropism just like, puts them all together and makes sense of them. Um, oh, so the, back to the, the, the research, which is currently like happening, um, I think, Valeria Garau, who has done this questionnaire, um, is currently writing up. It ran for about three and a half weeks, and she got more than a thousand participants. She got a thousand one hundred participants, um, seven hundred or so of them autistic, which for a master's project is just ridiculous. Like that just doesn't that never happens. As a postdoc, um, I'm jealous of those numbers. But... <laughs> um, and yeah, it's it's because. Autistic people have been talking about this for decades. Finally, someone is actually like bothering to do the empirical research to try and start to measure it. Um, and I mean, I should say that that she's not the only one. Like, there are, I think, at least two other substantial research projects going on um, in different parts of the world. So it's exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing what the next few years bring. Mm, mm. That brings me back to um, one of Monique's points um, that she always, they always describe as really kind of frustrating um, as a researcher is, is that constant swing between we have to put it into research to trust that autistic people can actually report about their own experience. So that's, that's always a slight annoyance, is it? It's like for years and years and years as a community, we've known that this is a thing but we have to wait until it goes into research where somebody essentially just uses our own knowledge to then go, oh, yeah, it's definitely a thing we wrote down. <laughs> I always find that kind of ironic. At the same time, though, I'm usually pleased to see it being researched. Oh, like, yeah, even absolutely. If, it, even if it's just a test of something that autistic people have been saying for decades. But again, um, it goes back I'd to much that. much rather that researchers spent their time doing that than pursuing most of the things that research. autism researchers have pursued. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's about that autistic monotropic emotion, isn't it? It's never one thing. We're really pleased that somebody's researching, but at the same time, it's like, why do we have... So there's all these things all over the place, monotropically. <laughs> so the next point that I wanted to ask then is the theory, the monotropic theory and its importance for humanising autistic people while respecting our differences. Um, this is why I would argue the majority of autistic people who know about double empathy problem and monotropic theory like it because it explains or attempts to explain who we are and why we're different without saying we're broken, which is what the very flawed um, mainstream, in quotation marks, theories that are derived from non-autistic people, they don't explain autistic experience, really, at all. Um, deeply, deeply flawed. And they frame us as the problem. So can we speak to that, to speak to this idea that monotropic theory humanises us, and in what way? Um, while respecting our differences? See, so I, I had to write about this for the Masters at Sheffield and, and, you know, in true demand avoidance style. And I think it's brilliant that we have theories like monotropism and double empathy, you know, the double empathy problem. And, you know, but I wouldn't say they're particularly humanising. I would just say that they are theories that don't rely on calling you know they're just not putting people down or dehumanizing you know that's all it is 
it's just saying that this is the, this is different. This is an egg and this is a chicken. Not this is a really horrible chicken because it's not an egg. <laughs> it, you know, so I think I love I just think that we, we've had such awful treatment as autistic people and I'm not detracting from any of the work that any of the wonderful autistic researchers have done. But it's not humanizing per se. It's just not disadvantaging somebody. It's just saying this is a thing in my in my kind of opinion. Mm. Um, and that, that's basically all it is, right? But at the same time, I think understanding is humanizing. Mm. Um, if someone's behavior seems alien to, the, to you, you can't make sense of it, then they seem alien to you. So in that sense, anything which helps people to understand what is going on for autistic people is humanizing um and i think montropism really does that like it it it, mm. it just makes so much about autistic behavior and autistic communication or autistic experience less mysterious yeah um and if someone is a mystery to you then you just you can't fully accept them and you can't fully empathize with them because they don't don't make mm. sense Mm. And I think as well, for looking at it from that perspective, as I think the most important thing is that a lot of autistic people, we're in a very privileged position to have access to the community that we do. A lot of autistic people can go through their entire lives and not understand themselves. And you can have a 10 minute conversation with an autistic person about monotropism and how that fits into their experience. And you can change their entire view on themselves. And then they're able to then view themselves through a less awful lens, if you like, that's been kind of given to them. So I would say, yeah, the knock on effect of that and the way that it kind of, you know, I think I said I can get monotropism down to a seven minute spiel now for a local authority, MDT. Um, but yeah, to do that for an actual person and even children, like, you know, I've got a, a five year old and, and, he has various cognitive difficulties, but even he grasps the the basics of kind of monotropism. Um, but yeah, it's very humanizing in that way. But when it was written, it's just kind of, this is a thing and this is a, what happens without putting the neurotypical spin on it. I wanna speak to that if that's okay, because so we've got here, for instance, Ruth Ray, um, fantastic name. Um, how long before it trickles down to the more mainstream in quotation marks, e.g. the National Autistic Society courses that we all get sent to? Um, I'm so sorry that you get sent to those, if I'm honest. Um, please find autistic led training. Um, we ourselves do autistic led training. Um, and so I don't know is the answer to places like NAS because they have their own agendas and I'm not going to go into that and try and get political. Um, but there are, so, cause I, one of my comments that I had for us was what are the practical applications and potentials for monotropism? Um, you might have very particular interests in where you hope it goes in terms of maybe research or what people might do with it. Um, but, by listening to you talking, it's making me realise that some of the things that, for instance, Annette Foster and I do in training with professionals, but actually with young autistic people themselves, is about explaining about that difficulty and the cruelty of trying to pull somebody out of an attention tunnel, for instance. So one of the things that Annette started doing quite early on in their sort of PhD career and things like this was doing mindful stims and which we've done before in academy where you ask a group of people find an object and then we do a very guided note the weight of your object look at it in the light and all this kind of thing when you do that with neurotypical people or largely neurotypical people what we then do is we go around and we get half the room who have been stimming with their object to go and watch the other half of the room and then to start interrupting them and then to tell them to stop doing that weird thing that they're doing and all this kind of stuff. And then we have a discussion afterwards. And as you can imagine, neurotypical people, largely neurotypical people, um, 
they talk about it. They talk about how it, it felt really unnerving to be pulled out of that because actually they started to get quite relaxed and into it and they started to get, they don't say necessarily into the flow, but that's what they mean. Um, and okay, they're never going to get, it's never going to be that intense flow that an autistic stimmer is having when they're getting really into whatever the thing might be, but they are, they get it at that point. They're like, okay, yeah, we can understand why and how much more intense an autistic person might feel about that. But as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, that is that us showing them? Is that us finding a practical application of like the issue with putting somebody out of a flow state? Tanya's nodding. Okay, thank you. Thanks, that helps. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like, Chloe, you're almost like learning learning things backwards in a way because you don't know all that much about modern tropism, but you've got everything else top ticked off. <laughs> so it's almost like it's backwards learning. I'm going to be honest, the term, even as an academic, the term and the writing on it kind of, kind of scares me, puts me off a bit, which is why I'd rather have a discussion about it with people. And it has put, I have put off really looking into it until I would have Fergus to come and explain it to me and makes me feel comfortable about having this discussion, right? So yeah, put me off. The word, big word. I sometimes wonder if it, they should have just gone with attention tunnels or flowiness. Um, yes. I've been in, in, enjoying seeing Jamie Knight um, talk about like just flowy, you know, it's just a flowy kind of mind. You know, needs to get into flow states. Mm. Um, I guess, oh, oh, that, oh. Oh, oh, sorry, I just saw this question. I remember, um, I do believe Kieran and another group of people as well have brought monotropism into the NHS, haven't they? Um, they got a lot of pilot for tier four training for mental health services, and they've done um, resources basically to be shared about monotropism. Um, I know local authorities, every single local authority that I work with, every school, every social work, everybody, psychiatrists, psychologists. I've actually had a, a forensic psychologist in tears, realising that their entire career was a waste of time. But anyway, <laughs> like proper person, I was like, oh, what do I do with this? There's a neurotypical person crying at me after two hours of speaking about autistic experience and neurodiversity. But um, yeah, no, so it is getting out there. And I know that Academy do a lot of things for local authorities as well which hopefully monotropisms even if you don't know it is also feeding into that because it's the basis of everything so it's everywhere so what I do I, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I do so when I do deliver training and I because there's numerous types of training that I deliver and when I do ones where I explain what is this thing called autism and what is actual autistic experience um I don't even bother going into or even really picking apart the really flawed and debunked theories that exist already I might list them and just put a cross through them and be like these are flawed go away and have a look at this research evidence that demonstrates why and then I have my my slides on double empathy problem and monotropism so even if I don't go into detail I flag it I'm like these are two autistic derived um autistic community backed theories about our experiences um, so people get that they, they get those from me even if I can't explain it very well <laughs> but now that it, it can it's an idea that the you know has been the versions of it have been independently developed numerous times like from my perspective if you understand autism sufficiently well then you're going to come up with something along the lines of monotropism so like a, a sufficiently advanced version of any any given autism theory will eventually take you to something that looks a lot like it um whether or not it's that that name is being used um mm. yeah it, it is it's you know it's it's turning up in more and more relatively mainstream autism training and so on um, but I'm conscious that this is mostly a British phenomenon so um, I compiled a list of university courses that uh, talk about it. And I think there are about seven different universities around the UK that I was able to verify have monotropism in their courses when they talk about autism. Um, but I haven't found any that are, out that are outside of the UK yet. Mm. Um, yeah, so so Kieran's animation uh, with Chloe Farahar and others for the purpose of NHS training. 
was you? Was it? I'm not in there. No, I wish no, that's I was. you. Where's, where's my brain gone? Hang on. Who do I, I, I mean? I mean, I'm in Georgia Pavlopoulou. What the heck? It's just a completely different yeah. name. Completely um, different name. Another yeah. name, a word that I can't pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah um so yeah kieran did a, a brilliant four minute animation i mean he didn't animate it but he did, he narrated it and wrote it um and that is on monotropism.org which is a site mm. that i made last month well i was just flagging this, so your link, yeah your link tree here Fergus. does that have also that new website should do yeah yeah i think it's okay, probably the, the top link on it yeah so for people who can't read it so it's a url and it's the, the word L I N K P R dot double E forward slash O O L O N G for anyone yeah. who wants to go to that site. But yes, monotropism.org, um, I thought was a, a relatively easy to remember name. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I became aware that, and I've been aware for a long time, that when someone wants to find out about monotropism, I don't, I didn't really know where to send them, right? Like, so I, I wrote this this piece for the Psychologist magazine in 2018, um, which went down really well. I think it was like their most shared article of 2019. Um, and it's like a 15 minute read probably. And it's, I, I, I aimed to make it pretty accessible, but I know that that's not accessible for everyone. Um, and it's all, Conversely, it's not academic enough for everyone. It doesn't doesn't really have many references. Um, so one of the things that I did is I, I collected explanations at different levels of difficulty and sort of technicality um, so that people could pick their own explanations and kind of put put Kieran's four minute animation front and center because there's there's nothing in there that I would dispute and it's very easy to follow, I think. And I've got, yeah, so on academy.co.uk, I did a blog, I think, on autistic theories, and it's literally just double empathy and monotropism. That's the only theories that I will <laughs> that I will put on there. Um, I just want to come yeah. back to, oh, sorry, go on, Ted. Oh, I was going to say, I was going to make a tiny confession, though, because with my attention differences, I also share that kind of reading difficulty. And even though like, I'm so far through the masters at the minute and monotropism is really at the core feature of that never actually read any of the academic papers only only fergus's blog because hmm. it's just not necessary i don't think but yeah um academia can often be quite inaccessible even for those that are in it yeah, yeah. for what it's worth I, I i would say that attention monotropism and the diagnostic criteria for autism despite the extreme mouthful of a title is actually quite accessible like it's not it's not written at a technical level um but it does sort of spend time picking apart the dsm criteria as they existed back in 2005 so i guess that was dsm three still no is that potentially four four dsm four, four. yeah um yeah to be honest that's that i'm the same that's why i can never be bothered to write like academic papers because um it's just exhausting. So when I do write something, so when I wrote um, A Rose by Any Other Name with Smell of Stigma, I also made a cartoon for it because I just thought everyone learns in such different ways. So I also made a cartoon where there's audio. So if you're wanting to read, you could do read it, you could listen to the audio, you could watch the, the imagery and things. I just think we need more of that, much more of that. Um, I've got Ben here as well. So, because I was asking about the practical applications. So, um, Tanya, you've spoken about really how to to reduce that internalized ableism and that internalized prejudice and discrimination towards yourself by knowing mm -hmm. that actually, no, you've got a monotropic mind. It's not broken at all. Um, so, oh, yeah. Ben here is sorry, go on. So it's much more than that as well. It's much more than that. If you ha you have an autistic person that's experiencing mental health crisis, I mean, what I describe as the, you know, the cause of, of, of pushing past what your brain can deal with, it's, well, I call it monotropic split because that's what happens. It goes, um, you know, so when you're dealing with mental health crisis and you're in recovery from that, wouldn't you explain to somebody you know that their mind is is a monotropic mind so therefore you've got to save those spoons and this is why because this is the basis so actually try and find things to keep your attention in don't try and force your attention elsewhere don't try and do things that aren't natural and yeah it's all tied into the ableism but it's also very practical in a way because once people have that understanding 
I mean, we all know the phrase cams kills kids because, you know, and parents specifically as well, because, you know, we're turning up to cams and they're no help if you can get in front of them or they're medicating kids or misdiagnosing them. But actually, if you give them the tools to go, no, this is how your brain works. So when you do things in a way that your brain doesn't work, this is going to be the result. So let's try and do more of these things. So even just that in a practical way is can be hugely life changing. For people not in the UK, CAMS is our um, child and adolescent mental health services through, throughout the mm. UK, um, just, just in case people don't know. Um, and, and what Ben is saying here, I think, speaks to this of how it makes you feel like okay my brain is not broken um, so ben says i feel validation in recognizing and understanding why my brain is different putting the name or theory to something can make someone feel more able to embrace who they are compared to not knowing what's going on um, and andrew here um, says that they like ben's quote um, oh i'm going to come back to that because i've got some good comments as well from um the chat still oh ben is that chat for just us oh, okay because you've put it in the chat box so ben also says i recognize now my overwhelm and my attention tunnel is interrupted which is why i now don't start an activity and until i know i can get um, through it without being bothered which helps me avoid the overwhelm like so like i say and this is the thing it's about not fighting i think that's uh, sometimes when people come to have a consult with me it's almost like they are still trying to fight the autism, as it were. And, and really what we want to be doing is working with it and working with our way of experiencing the world. Um, mm -hmm. I want to give an example of something that I realised recently. And I think now my my little bit better understanding of monotropism can help me understand this better. So I went to a restaurant for the first time since before the pandemic. So that's a very long time. We're talking like 2019. I think the last time maybe I went to a restaurant, maybe a little bit into 2020. And I went with a neurodivergent person. So we were talking about things I was really interested in, i.e. neurodivergent stuff. Um, but I became very overwhelmed. But overwhelmed, I wanted to find out from this person because they're, they're new into their discovery. So I was like, what does overwhelm mean to you? And they talked about anxiety. I don't necessarily get anxiety when I'm overwhelmed. I get overwhelmed. And I wanted to pick apart what that meant. And so what was really interesting, so this restaurant, if you think in pictures, you'll be able to imagine this, um, busy restaurant, but we sat in a sort of, um, it was outside of the restaurant, they have an awning and then a bit of glass so that you're protected because it's on the sea, so on the coast. So I was really hot because I was in, this like little glass enclosed thing noise from the main restaurant even though we'd sat outside of the main restaurant so i had um a, a loop in that ear to try and block as much of the noise so a loop uh, blocks out about 27 decibels as much noise from the restaurant as possible and i had a flare in this one so i could still hear my conversation partner but i was getting overwhelmed by the fact all i could think about was how hot i was that my dress was sticking to me that i could hear the noise and it was just all that complexity was overlapping and I later realized the issue I was having and what the overwhelm meant for, meant for me and it meant that I could not hear the pictures in my head I'm going to explain that um, because I've thought about this quite a lot since that happened so my conversation partner I could hear the words perfectly my ears were picking it up I knew what the words were as it were as in like I could hear them my ears were working fine my brain was taking that information in but everything else was muting and washing out, if you like, the pictures in my head. Because I'm a very, very visual thinker. Not all of us are. Some of us are affants, don't think in pictures at all. And I'm a hyperfan. And they were telling me a story about something. And the story included the um, description of a flatbed truck. Or it just included the term flatbed truck. I heard the word flatbed truck. My brain could not quickly grasp the picture of a flatbed truck. So I had no idea what they were saying. Had no idea what yeah. they were talking about, even though I could hear the words. So hopefully if anyone knows or experiences that, I feel That's... like you've explained now what I was trying to understand about how I couldn't hear the pictures. Yeah, so you didn't have the space to do auditory processing. Mm -hmm. 
So you've got so much going on and so much screaming at you because you're uncomfortable that you did not have the almost cognitive space left to give to your auditory processing, which, like me, turns things into pictures. Um, and that often, you know, we see that all the time with children. It's not that they don't hear things. It's that they get stuck. Or even with me, it's like, yeah, I've heard all the words. You know, even when, you know, somebody says something and you go, what did you say? And the rep- and then you get it because it's like something gets stuck, which is auditory processing, which is an unconscious attention tunnel. It's an unconscious thing that we have to do. So you Homer Simpson did <laughs> in a way. <laughs> so, and that's what happens with the overwhelm. And that's what we're always consciously trying to avoid. And that's what neurotypicals describe as anxiety. It's not it's survival, <laughs> you know. Um, I think autistic anxiety is very, very, I don't even, I really try and use the word anxiety when we're in in reference to an autistic person and tend to stick to the kind of like hyper aroused or extra aroused or extra aware. And that happens, you know, when I was talking about something that I call monotropic split, like when somebody's pushed into that level, they almost get pushed into kind of a meerkat zone. They're constantly waiting for the next thing to come. But when you understand kind of the monotropic elements and everything else that's happening and their ability to regulate from a sensory perspective and the feeling that they're constantly in danger and and that kind of split that's already happened because their processing is like an elastic band that's been stretched too far and won't go back. It just makes sense. <laughs> it's not anxiety. It's it's a monotropic split. It's when your brain has been pushed too far. And sometimes we catch that and that's where the, you know, the fear and the control needs to come in. And that's because you're trying to control things to kind of free up some space. Um, But that's not happening. Um, But if you're constantly doing that continuously, 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 that's when we start going down the route of what would be known as mental health problems. For me, that that's the basis. (laughs) Yeah, it brings us back to alexithymia and that thing of people think they know what emotion words mean, but they don't really. <laughs> so people think they know what anxiety means, but actually they can be talking about really different things Yeah, by the same name. Yeah. Do you think they can or do you think maybe um, neurotypical people just don't have the same intense, diverse, deep experiences that we do? Maybe that's another way. I, th- I think autistic people tend to experience things more intensely. Mm. Um, I'm not. I kind of. I don't. I don't want to get carried away with with the idea that autistic people don't like experience fundamentally different things from other people. No. Um, I think you know different people do experience things differently, but there there are you know the underlying systems which are behind emotions um are kind of mostly the same mm. they they're, they're just differences at other levels and so does my explanation of i couldn't hear the pictures does does that make sense to you fergus sort of okay <laughs> yeah i mean i think i know what you mean yeah yeah um, well, and yeah, that, that thing of like not having your, your brain tuned in to auditory processing is a very common autistic experience. And like quite often people sort of haven't had time to switch tunnels so they'll miss the start of what someone is saying. And sometimes it's like it's buffered so they can kind of play it back and just know what was said but often, you know, we need to get people to repeat things. Well, like I said, that's the thing. You know, I could come away from that situation and I remember the words that, that this person said and then I could process the imagery that goes along with what those words are and then I understand. Whereas, like I say, at the time, everything overlapping watered down the pictures and that meant I didn't understand what was being said at all. Um, somebody's actually asked, um, do the ear things really help in noisy environments? I can't hear a conversation in a busy pub, for example, but there's nothing wrong with your hearing, uh, their hearing, sorry. I just can't process out the background noise. Um, absolutely. I think because, I, as I described, that was the first time I've been to a restaurant in a long time. And I think it would have been a lot worse. And I think I probably couldn't have stayed as long as I did without a loop in one ear and a flare in the other. Um, that was me managing the best I could 
uh, to, to try and reduce the overwhelm that I was going to get from like the sensory back, background noise mm. and, and all this kind of thing. But I couldn't distract myself from how hot and uncomfortable in my own skin I felt. That's a horrible feeling um, mm. to, to have. Um, don't want to go on too much longer. I've kind of got one key question, um, but we've kind of approached it, which is about the future of monotropism. But I just want to grab so that I don't lose them. Both Estin and Andrew VC, um, I think I'm pronouncing that right, have both kind of asked about how monotropism might either differ or be related to. So um, ADHD. So here Estin says, if there's time towards the end, we're at the end, Estin, uh, would it be interested in talking a bit about whether or how ADHD attention differences might also be explained through monotropism? So attention tunnels, flow state, sensory issues, and where the differences might lie. Um, and then politely, no worries if not. <laughs> Any thoughts to that? Yeah, I mean, it's such a good question. Sorry, do you want to go, Tanya? And uh, yeah, I mean, depending on what you're reading about ADHD, ADHD is very much like um, autism, if you like. It's very much based on an, an outside kind of perspective. There's so much in common between the two. I tend to try not to separate them because you would just put yourself in a bit of a monotropic spiral and it would get into a mess um but yeah it's so i mean there's so much research out there there's some research that suggests it, it's two different presentations of the same thing there's some research that suggests it's entirely different and ultimately you know we've not got to get into that argument and i think that monotropism does definitely fit within adhd but again i think it comes back to that that attention being pulled in all different places there are so many you know there's so many different it could be a sensory thing it could be related to sensory issues we know that there's a lot of massive misdiagnosis rate with adhd and sensory processing differences for example i think they there was one paper that i read where i think it was like 40 percent of autistic children that were diagnosed and medicated for adhd actually were given um sensory diets etc and that got rid of the necess the need um so yeah you can't really pick apart the two but what's the difference between autism and adhd there's you can't so yeah it applies in every same way yeah i i think adhd is are uh, monotropic um possibly not universally it's possible that not all autistic people are monotropic um you know because the way that these things are currently defined is based mm. on external observations and behaviors. We don't know if they're coming from the same place cognitively, right? Mm. Um, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that certainly most ADHDers are, are monotropic, but I, I don't think it's the full story. Um, but you know, there, there's so much variation within autism. Mm. So when people are like, oh, but ADHD has these characteristics and autism doesn't, it's like, a, autism has these characteristics and autism doesn't. Do you know what I mean? It's like these things vary greatly. And I think in the end, we're trying to like. Are we frozen? Carve up a On multi dimensional really... landscape. In... Oh, it just disconnected for a moment. Yeah, yeah, you're um, back now. Yeah, so like my guess would be that. ADHDers who are not not diagnosed as autism are maybe a bit less monotropic, um, and people who are autistic but don't qualify for an ADHD diagnosis are maybe just sufficiently capable of accessing flow states and haven't been like traumatized out of accessing them on a regular basis. But mm. you know, so much more research is required. Yeah, yeah, and then a number of people are talking about ADHD. So when you're both autistic and <clears throat> ADHD. Yeah, I was a bit surprised. Um, sorry, when I wrote the piece with the psychologist, um, me and monotropism, how many ADHDers came out and said, This just sounds like ADHD. <laughs> like, I hadn't quite expected that it, it would resonate so strongly. I, I think there's a massive problem. We we know about the issues with the diagnostic criteria. I mean, it's something, isn't it? When actually, the you know, we now know empirically that. The way that a person gets on with another autistic person is more 
you know, accurate in detecting whether or not they may be autistic than some kind of diagnostic criteria that hasn't changed for however many years. And it's based very much on the, it's just an abstract concept. And I think ADHD is, it can also be very much like that as well, to a certain degree. Um, and and I think that me and you, me and you have, Chloe, have spoken about this before. It's like when, when we're working with neurodivergent people, we aren't, you know, we're not asking about the labels that they've been given or the diagnosis or the criteria that they've met in order to go, oh, you're not this, you're not that. We're, we're doing it to build a picture of how might be best to communicate with them or to interact with them. So I'm kind of all for not separating it all out too much, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and somebody, uh, so Ellie um, Langstrump, um, who, who's, I think they were doing your PhD? Or are you doing your master's? I can't remember any. Um, so yeah, saying they've met ADHDs that just have nothing autistic about them whatsoever. Sometimes I wonder if there are two ADHDs, one totally unrelated to autism, one that's just on the other side of the autism coin, so to speak. Um, just speculation. But yeah, so so like I say, I think it is interesting because we ke I keep talking about it. I keep talking about what kind of cake are we? What kind of pastry are we? So, you know, what's the ingredients that makes you you is much more interesting than are you specifically, are you just autistic? Are you just ADHD? No, I want to know, do you think in pictures or not? Um, is your communication solely or largely that kind of autistic monologuing? Is it the ADHD sort of all about the houses and, and they don't take a break for or a breath for like 20 minutes, so I just have to make notes and then come back to it? Um, and all of that is, like I say, Tanya, we simply do that not to label but to know how to engage with that person um know how to um communicate yeah, yeah. And oh, I think okay it, yeah, it ellie's... Like ellie's, yeah ellie's um ellie's comment was again really really interesting as well because she was saying that she's met and observed adhd people that are nothing like autistic people but again that's what's going on from the outside so how do you know you know all AD, like I th i'm pretty sure that part of the adhd diagnostic criteria i don't know too much about it is sensory differences and the ability to actually hyper focus ADHDs do have that I'm pretty sure that's well known in ADHD kind of it's well known I've, I've got a feeling it's not part of the diagnostic criteria is it not I don't know anything about ADHD because I just yeah, view it as one, one of the really kind of things about ADHD versus autism is how on the surface, if you read like formal descriptions of both, it sounds like they have hardly anything in common. But then as soon as you talk to people assessed as mm. either, it turns out we've got an absolute ton, including yeah, things like sensory differences. Mm. And I do have plans actually to have a small number of, a very small number of ADHDs um, on to do exactly that, to do what we've done in the past, which is pick apart and compare the diagnostic criteria for this thing called autism versus what autistic people actually say I want to I want people to do the same um and and Tanya we've, we've joked about this before but I'm really not ADHD enough if you like to really understand that sort of impulsivity and spontaneity of thoughts and the brain that that's how I've been told now quite rightly, um, because I kept focusing on, oh, it's attention differences. And I've been told quite rightly by a number of ADHDs, it's not attention differences. It's the spontaneity and the impulsivity of my brain that to outsiders looks like attention differences. And so that's why I want some some ADHDs to come on and and put me right. Tell me tell me what it actually is mm -hmm. um, and do something similar. So compare, um, like I say, the diagnostic criteria with, well, what is it actually when you're experiencing it? Um, so, and it would be really nice to see how autistic theory fits into that as well. That would be a really interesting conversation, actually. That's looked at through a non-deficit lens, because I think all the research that's looked at the the two things have all been quite yeah. And somebody, just, yeah, yeah, Ruth, just saying, you know, I think of myself as neurodivergent because I can't pick apart my brain wiring. There's autism and ADHD in there, and. That's absolutely, I mean, that's pretty much, you know, Nick Walker's take is even, should we, do we need to even have these like autistic camps, if you like? Um, I'm not saying we're there yet, but, you know, her point is just neuroqueer, be neuroqueer, do the neuroqueering of, of your yourself as well as your brain naturally being neuroqueer, but neuroqueer that as well, um, which I think is quite important. So... 
very, very, very briefly, as much as possible, because um, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but what do we hope for in terms of the future of monotropism? So the reason I also flagged that is because I'm hoping Tanya, when David's feeling a bit better, or no, they're not poorly, but when they've got the energy and the spoons, to come back and talk about things like explaining, what have I got here, autistic experience to autistic and non-autistic people with the monotropic theory, but you're interested, aren't you, in explaining emotions and mental health um so yeah what what do we hope for in terms of the future of monotropism as a theory i'm gonna go with fergus do you want to go first fergus or do you want me to um lots more research um and application you know so um and there's been work done on monotropism at school and that ties in so closely with all the stuff on self-directed ed education um, I've been mm. reading Naomi Fisher, whose next book is all about neurodiversity and education, which I'm really excited about. Um, monotropism in play in, in mental health and like identity formation. Um, you know, Kira, Kira and Amy talk about monotropism in their piece on um, theorizing autistic masking. Um, so yeah, all of all of these practical applications are vital um but i also hope to see a lot more of it just displacing other autism theories which are bad <laughs> and like actively stigmatizing and based all around what's supposedly wrong with autistic people and entirely viewed from outside so like for me that's probably the single biggest application of monotropism as a theory is pushing out bad theories and just helping people understand what's actually going on yeah i think for me like the ultimate would be um whenever you ask somebody what what autism is um you know they reel off a set of diagnostic criteria nobody can actually tell you what it is or they go oh it's a different brain wire and it's a different this it's a different that for me and maybe it's because you know it's something that i live eat and breathe monotropism provides a really simple foundational basis of understanding autistic experience so i would like when i ask somebody what autism is whether it be a teacher a doctor whatever for them to be able to tell me this is what it is this it's attention tunnels it's flow state it's not being able to shift attention so quick quickly but taking in so much more detail that's what i would like and i would like monotropism to you know create the basis of much more looking at autistic mental health specifically because that is such a big a big thing um that we you know we don't have to talk about numbers and, and what's going horribly wrong but um yeah and also post-diagnostic support i would like monotropism very much to be put into post-diagnostic or even pre-diagnostic support you know and teaching it to children i do cover it when i say i cover it very briefly when we do our post-diagnostic stuff so it does get in yeah. there I just hope people I'd go like, away and they... I'd like that to be, um, you know, when you're handed your leaflets because your child's just been diagnosed autistic, what you get is monotropism and double empathy. That's what you get. You don't get NAS. You don't get the triad, of, the triad of, or diad of impairments. That's what I'd like it to be. Um, on that note, I, I, I feel like it, I should briefly draw attention to um, a guy called Keeping It All Inside which is intended for autistic girls, mainly and parents of autistic girls, although it is quite clear inside that it is not just talking about girls. It's talking about anyone with a so-called internal presentation, you know, who sort of learns to pass as neurotypical-ish, more or less, basically. Um, and that talks about monotropism. Um, so yeah, you know, more and more resources that people are getting are, but so many still aren't, and it's, it's a wasted opportunity every time they don't. Mm. Well, I mean, and so Estin, in terms of monotropism, would love to see more on education or actually on unschooling and self-directed learning with a deconstructing childism lens and monotropism. Um, and, and Estin, I actually, there was a really good comment they had earlier, but sadly the conversation moved on, was talking about the issue of, of childism that um, happens. So I think that was back when we were talking around um, actually how a lot of our young people Neuro, young neurodivergent people actually know what they need and then because of childism they lack of autonomy and things like that 
um, it is a huge issue. So Essin talks about this quite a lot, actually, this issue of childism. Um, mm. Essin, that might be a really good topic, actually, you know, if you want to come on and let's talk about this issue of childism. Um, OK, so thank you so much. I think that was all the main comments because there have been some really good comments. Um, I just want to flag this one from Nikki, actually. So Nikki Duncan. So monotropism in ADHD, polytropic monotropism. Fergus is laughing. So intensely interested in everything, apart from the things that you're not interested in. <laughs> um, so I like that. That was good. So as we like to um, always finish on, um, what at this point in time is everyone's favourite stim or just the stim that they're doing the most at the moment. So we're going to start with Fergus because you're our, our guest, our new guest. So what's your favourite stim at the moment or one you're doing the most? Hmm. Um, apart from films of water in slow motion that I already mentioned, which I feel like we should probably share a link somewhere. Um, I'm doing quite a lot of sort of head, head like massaging, hair playing with. That's a nice one. Nice. I I will I will pretend I know what that feels like. <laughs> I haven't felt that for a very long time. <laughs> for those who don't remember, I don't have any hair if you can't see us on the screen. <laughs> um, and Tanya, what are your what's your favourite stim at the moment? Oh, I have to think of a new one every single time. So apart from the the old uh, crush in the hands of the proprioceptive seeking, I think Ben's witnessed this. I've um <laughs> I've turned into a bit of a human jukebox recently, haven't I, Ben, when I'm not masking? <laughs> so we often like are in Zoom rooms working together. And uh, I, I create this habit and I don't know what it is, but every time somebody says a word and it associates with a song, I turn into a human jukebox. So, yeah, <laughs> that's been quite interesting and quite stimmy. Nice. But, yeah, you is just go like, with it. Is that like when people, doesn't matter how many times I use the word or somebody else uses the word phenomenon? I phenomenon. Do, 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 do. Yeah. yeah, but it's almost like a compulsion I have to sing and it can literally be related to because music is a massive stimmy thing for me especially when it comes to like interception, alexithymia and experience and emotion so I'm just like a human jukebox so every time and it could be the most inappropriate thing as well <laughs> the most inappropriate song come out but yeah it's hilarious and um, Ben at the moment what is your favourite stim? Oh Ben's having a thing. He says, ironically, oh, not... a lot of vocal stims at the minute. Ironically. What kind of vocal stims? I'm not asking you to do them, but like, are they particular sounds? Because you're always quite swears or swears. whistling. <laughs> um, I, I think I... swearing is a type of stimming for an autistic person because it's almost like that emotional release, isn't it? To do that swearing. Um, and our very, very final question, Ben, are you going to pin it? You can't find it, can you? I'll do it for you. Here you go. What is your favourite form of potato? It's a tough one, huh? It's got to be roast potatoes. Like a really good roast, roast potato is just incredible. I don't know. Um, the Dauphinois potato is nice as well. Is that how you pronounce it? Dauphinois? I have no Dauphinois, idea. Dauphinois. I don't know. Monotropism, nice. monotropism. <laughs> Um, and Ben, just for those who can't see him, is currently using the potato filter with the um, uh, gaming headset that he sometimes uses when he feels a little bit more or less rather uncomfortable. No, more uncomfortable or not as comfortable on screen. Um, and Ben has joked in the past, haven't you, Ben? You're like, you're waiting that when we, for somebody to answer when we ask this question, what is your favourite form of potato for people to say Ben? Haven't you? <laughs> He's got like the cheeky, there you go, Bobby said it for you. There you go. Um, potato Ben, there you go. That, Bobby says that you are the favourite form of potato. So it's just like this ongoing joke, Fergus. For a while, it was um, the, are you team? Oh, no, please don't. Mayonnaise, <laughs> but we moved on from that. We're now on to what is your favourite form of potato? Um, thank you, everyone, so, so much for being here. Um, hopefully, if we get the pre-record done, um, which should be happening next week, we will be having... Um, Tanya Canedo, I'm probably really butchering that name too, and they're going to talk about being autistic and ADHD in Mexico, so that's going to be really interesting. So we're having to pre-record because of the time differences, um, but we will stream it live and be able to have like chats in the comment section, so that one's going to be interesting. So what is it like to be autistic and ADHD in Mexico? Um, thank you everyone, we're going to awkward wave while I do the outro music. <laughs>
Ben is kind of waving, but if everyone remembers that um, Ben doesn't have hands as a potato. <laughs> Potatoes don't have hands. They really don't. But I've, uh, 